In this video, we are going to look at the RISC-V processor architecture and consider how we can write programs for the RISC-V and compile them and execute them in simulation on an x86 processor. First, we will look at the variants of the RISC-V instruction set architecture, briefly look at the setup for running simulations and show a demonstration of a Hello World program. First things first, what is an instruction set architecture? Instructions are basically opcodes or binary numbers that tell the processor what to do at each point in time. The exact names that are given to instructions don't really matter. You'll find names like load word or load byte or load immediate. But in many cases, what might actually happen is that some of these names might actually be mnemonics or pseudo instructions that get translated into more than one instruction opcode on the actual process. One of the things that is specified by the ISA is the length of the instructions. This is where you get 32 bit ISAs and 64 bit ISAs. It also specifies the type and number of registers that are available to the programmer and the types of operations that are available. There are usually many extensions and variants to an ISA. Even the x86 architecture has many variants. Some of the variants add functionality like floating point, then uh, vector instructions and so on. Similarly, the RISC-V instruction set also has many variants. What is RISC-V? It's an open standard architecture that was primarily designed by David Patterson's group at UC Berkeley. It was basically designed as an open instruction set architecture, meaning that anyone can build a compatible processor. It's based on RISC principles, the reduced instruction set computing. And this has some nice properties from the point of view of hardware implementation. The fact that the ISA is open means that there can be many different implementations of this, but they all have to have the same functionality. Now, of course, the interesting part over here is just because the ISA is open doesn't mean that somebody else can copy your design. How you implement it and how you make it fast or power efficient is still a secret that is left to the individual hardware designer. The specification of RISC-V is given at the website RISCV, risc -V or RISC-V.org and you can download it for free. The version that I'm going to be using in this course is based on June 2019. There has been a subsequent update in December 2019, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter because the 32-bit integer set is pretty much stable at this point. There are many variants, as I said, to the architecture. The RBWMO that is mentioned over here is basically the memory model that is used. And uh, yes, you do need to understand a little about it, but this is not really part of the instruction set. RV32I is basically the RISC-V 32-bit integer instruction set and 64I is the 64-bit integer instruction set. We will primarily be focusing on RV32I. Why? Because it's relatively compact few instructions and 32 bit makes it a little bit easier for us to understand what the implementation looks like. We don't unnecessarily need to carry 64 bits around for everything. There are many different variants. There are embedded variants, 128 bit instructions. There are a lot of fence variants, M with multiplication, F with floating point and so on. Most of these are in a fairly stable state, but for our purposes, we want to first concentrate on the minimal instruction set that is required in order to get a working computer. After that, we can basically see what are the other functionality that can be added. On. As I said, one of the things that is specified is the registers. What we have in this architecture is 32 registers, which is specified using the value X length in the specification document. Either 32 or 64 is the most common. It does have a 16-bit and a 128-bit variant, which are not really very popular. In this course, we'll be using xlen equal to 32, which means that all the registers themselves are 32 bits and there are 32 of them. How, they, how you should implement the architecture of the registers, how they should be connected, how big they sh the gates should be, what kind of current they should drive, all those are not part of the specification, of course. All right, so the RV32I variant. Don't worry about the picture on the right. I did not want you to read the document over there. I just wanted to put that to show that the entire base instruction set can be captured within 40 lines. Right? There are the, these 40 instructions constitute the 32-bit integer variant. That's it. 
And if you look closely, you'll realize that even here, there's a lot of repetition. There are, for example, six different branch statements. There are similarly some five or six different loads, uh, three different store instructions, and a lot of arithmetic and logic instructions. So if you look closer at this, you'll find basically there are several branch instructions, load store, arithmetic, and a few instructions right at the end that basically do some kind of interfaces to an operating system, which means that it's quite easy to implement something of this sort. So, which is why we are taking it up as the target. It also means that the way the instructions are designed makes them very easy to decode in hardware. In other words, this instruction set has actually been designed in a relatively sensible manner. The, you can contrast this with something like the x86, which was designed before people really paid too much attention to how the decoding of an instruction set happens. It's not to say that x86 is not an, a sensible instruction set. It's definitely usable and very useful, but there are problems with the design of the instruction set that sometimes make it hard to implement in hardware. Now, there is also something called the ABI or the application binary interface, which is a convention. What you can see over here is the convention that is used for the ABI and these ABI names are often found in the assembly language that you see for the processor. In particular, the register X0 is sometimes given the ABI name 0. As we'll see later, it's basically hardwired to zero, which means that anytime you read X0, you can be guaranteed that the result will be zero. And anytime you try to write to X0, the result will basically be ignored. X0 will remain zero. X1 has the conventional name RA, which means it's the return address. X2 is the stack pointer. So we'll find that things like the function call returns, stacks, threads, and so on, are all useful from the context of how programs run and how the operating system interfaces with the program. But as you can see over here, unlike the x86, which has a dedicated stack pointer and other such registers, over here, they're just general purpose registers that have conventional names. One of them is used to indicate the return address, another one is used to indicate the stack pointer and so on. You'll also see on the right hand side, there is something called the saver which basically says whether it's the caller or the callee that is supposed to save these values. What that means is if I have one program or one function, which is calling some other function, what happens over there is that I need to save certain variables so that I can use them when I return. In this case, what we are saying is should the top level program that is the caller or the internal function, which is the callee, be the one to save these values and restore them before you return. So for example, in this case, the stack pointer is saved by the callee. What that means is once I go inside a function, I might create some new temporary variables there and that will all get pushed onto the stack and the stack pointer value is likely to change. When I return to my origin, I should re restore the original value of the stack pointer as it was and get back there. This, for example, is important when you try to implement things like recursion. Again, like I said, all this is convention. It's not enforced by the processor. It's just that when you write a C program or the compilers that are used will assume that this is being done. And therefore, if you don't follow this, you might end up confusing the program and getting the wrong results. So let's take a look at the, some basic programs that would be there in the RISC-V assembly language. First, let's start by looking at the most simple program, the you know, just immediately return a value program that was written for the x86 processor. As we saw, there was a label global start, the dot text section indicating that these are instructions. The $60 into RAX was basically the 60 is the system call function for returning to the operating system. 42 is the value to be returned. It's essentially this that constitutes the program. What does this look like in risk five? Very similar. We once again have a dot global start. The dot text is not explicitly necessary here. It implicitly assumes this. This is more a property of the assembler and not so much about the uh, something fundamental about risk five or x86. It's more about how the assembler interprets what you are writing. But if you look at the code itself, it's almost identical. You basically load the value 42 into a zero, which is the return value load the value 93 into A7, 
which is the system call and you do the e call function if we go back here we'll see that a0 is one of the return values a7 essentially contains one of the function arguments but the bottom line is these are used in order to store some return values and function calls so the putting the value of the system call id into the function argument and then jumping to a certain value means that you are calling that particular function similarly having a return value in a0 means that you are returning this particular value let's quickly look at how we would compile this now similar to the i have uh, created the files that we need vimrit42.s essentially contains this now similar to gcc if i just use the regular gcc and try to compile this i'll find that i run into an error it will basically say no such instruction because gcc is meant for the x86 and not for the risc file instead what we have is and this is already installed on the terminal that you have access to you can type the command risc 532 hit tab unknown elf unknown basically says it doesn't no operating system elf means that it's for the ex, uh, embed, uh, executable and linkable format for the risc 532 and now type gcc minus c ret42.s this should basically compile the ret42 into a .o file and yes we can see that now there is a ret42.o similarly i need to do risc 532 unknown elf ld and ret42.o and this compiles and creates a a.out file can i run this directly no it says execution format error the reason for that if i run the command file a.out i'll see that it says that this is of type ucb risc file therefore it is the wrong kind of executable if i run this for what i had in the earlier example for the x86 i'll see that it actually says elf 64 bit x86 64 for gnu linux and so on right that essentially tells me it's something that can execute on my laptop but this elf file a dot out is a 32 bit executable with the ucb risc 5 instruction set so now what happens i can't run it on my laptop so what can i do instead or on the terminal i need a simulator and in our case there is a simulator that i have already pre compiled and installed on the terminal it's called spike so spike by itself has a lot of different instructions it basically is a simulator meant for the risc 5 isa the default over here is the rv32i okay. now what can spike do it will essentially interpret the assembly language or the machine code of the risc 5 and execute those instructions one by one can i directly run it on this unfortunately no what will happen if i running spike if i try running spike a dot out is that it once again you know gives me some kind of strange errors over here and it's not really clear what's going on the reason for this is that my a dot out has been written in a way that it actually assumes that it will be called by an operating system which will jump to the start of the program do something and then it can call in a system call to exit or return spike by itself doesn't sort of model an operating system so instead what i need to do is run it using something called a proxy kernel the proxy kernel is installed in a specific location which is written into the environment variable rvpk and the exact path is given over here it is opt tools risc5 etc bin slash pk this is already installed on the terminal you should be able to use it without making any further changes so the way to run this would basically be call spike tell it that what it needs to run is the proxy kernel and then tell the proxy kernel that what it needs to run is a dot out when we do this we find that yes it ran of course it didn't show any result it just printed out this bbl loader but if you look over here you'll notice that the return value actually came out as 42 and we can do this over here echo dollar question mark yes 42 was the return value of the last thing to execute similarly we can now look at hello world and what does the hello world function look like in x86 assembly language we had once again a system call very similar in risc5 
you'll notice that once again, we basically load some address into the uh, A1 value. We have some other setup over here, and then we finally have an E call, which is similar to this system call. Finally, we need to set the return value to zero, say that we are calling the exit function, and then once again, do a return system call over here. Okay, so it's almost identical in both cases, risk five and uh, x86. What happens if I actually try running this? I have the code over here, hello.s, and you can see that this is basically what it is. How would I compile it? Risk 532 GCC minus C, hello.s. It creates a hello.o, and the risk 532 LD with hello.o will create the file a.out. I can now run spike a.out and sure enough it prints hello world so essentially to summarize in order to run on x86 we need a risk 5 simulator this is capable of directly running risk 5 executables but since we need some kind of an interface for input output and for the operating system function calls we use a proxy kernel this is launched before a.out and essentially acts like a wrapper around the actual function that you are trying to execute. In this way, you can try out different programs written for RISC V, write them either in assembly or you can even write them in C and compile them and then run them using the proxy kernel. That brings us to the end of this review of how we can run basic RISC V executables. In future, we'll be looking deeper into the instruction set how we can actually start implementing it and verifying the different functionality.